My talk is going to be about legal requirements for cryptographic security. So do lawyers actually have to regulate cryptography? Should they do that? Um, or is there an alternative? And how well do they succeed? Um, let me begin with a short commercial. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what my institutions are at Saarland University. So that's the Institute of Law and Informatics, uh, dominated by law professors. And actually, I'm probably the only law professor at a German university who never studied law. So I'm a computer scientist, but uh, working in the law department, but also in the uh, Center for IT Security, Privacy, and Accountability, which is dominated by computer scientists, uh, and which is going to become uh, Germany's largest computer science research center with uh, more than 500 researchers planned for the next few years. Um, and that has its challenges to be in these two roles. So the, it starts with uh, getting dressed in the morning. So if I have my lawyer's day, I will wear suit and tie. If I have my computer scientist's day, I won't. So uh, a colleague from the law department said to me, well, you're the only computer scientist who knows how to dress properly because she doesn't see me on these other days when I'm wearing my computer science dress. <coughs> today I'm somewhere in between, so no tie today. But let's talk about contents, actually. Though I think, actually, the, the clash of cultures between lawyers and computer scientists uh, plays a role. So um, we think differently. There's a different culture between both disciplines. And that means they don't usually like to talk to each other. And I think that has consequences. Um, let me still start by talking a bit about cryptography only, because I I think mm, some people who are not familiar with IT security or cryptography will usually think, well, cryptography, um, as we heard this morning, is encryption and uh, hiding messages and so on. But we also heard that's not quite true. Uh, so confidentiality, which is protected by encryption, is only one of the goals that um, cryptography deals with. So that's Alice sends a message to Bob. No one other than Alice and Bob should be able to read the message or to learn anything about the message. Um, except maybe it's left. But there is also authenticity. Alice sends a message to Bob, and Bob should be able to know whether the, the message is actually from Alice or from someone else. So if it's not uh, by Alice, then Bob should be able to notice that somehow. There's integrity, and the message should not be changed on the way from Alice to Bob. And there's non-repudiation. Later on, when Bob says, well, Alice, you sent me this message, and Alice says, no, I never did, then Bob should be able to prove to a third party that it was actually Alice's message and not tampered with by uh, anyone in between. So as I said, the first goal is um, realized by encryption. All the others are fulfilled by using digital signatures. And digital signatures are very important, cryptographic primitive, as we say. So it's a uh, cryptographic uh, scheme or algorithm that's a very basic one that's used in many different protocols and applications later on. So how do they work? Uh, don't worry, they work with a lot of mathematics, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but the general principle is kind of easy to understand. So if Alice wants to use a digital signature, she wants to sign a message, uh, then she uses a private key, some text or some uh, numbers or anything we don't need to care about. It's some data, which is uh, the private key. Um, and then she can send the message over an insecure channel where anyone might be able to change the message. But Bob is able to verify if it's changed on the way and if it's actually from Alice. And he does that by using Alice's public key, which he has to somehow get securely. And that's something we are going to talk about later. Uh, but that's the basic concept. The private key and the public key are somehow related. Uh, with the public key, you can verify the signature. Um, with the private key, you can generate the signature. And they somehow have a mathematical relation, which we don't need to care about. Important thing is the verification is going to fail if the message was not actually signed with Alice's private key or if it was changed afterwards. So. Uh, if you have any questions, by the way, feel free to interrupt in between as well, or at the end of course. So what do we use these digital signatures for? 
the obvious application is, well, they're called signatures. We're used to signatures under contract. So if you have some document uh, which you want to sign, you can use that. You can do that with digital signatures as well. So you sign any digital document. Less obvious is that you can also use it for secure key exchange uh, for encrypted communication um, with your bank, for example. Or um, you can use it to confirm transactions in Bitcoin and other blockchain-based systems. So um, we haven't talked about the use of signatures in blockchain before, but believe me, it's also one aspect that's uh, quite relevant uh, for blockchain technology. So. Let's stick with that for the technical part at first and have a look at legal aspects of signatures and whether that's actually the same. So the concept of signing documents is something that is quite old. So documents have been signed for many centuries uh, with normal signatures, not digital signatures. Of course. And the focus on signatures has been signatures of natural persons, people like you and me. There are similar concepts for legal entities. Um, so uh, an authority, for example, will have a seal or there might be a stamp which is used by the authority or by a private company uh, in a similar way to a signature of a human being. But in general, the focus of signatures is on natural persons, human beings. What are they for? Well, first of all, like the digital signatures, they're supposed to ensure the authenticity of documents um, they are also a symbol that the signer takes responsibility for the document. So you read it and you say, well, that's exactly what I want to vouch for, so I sign it. Um, signatures also provide evidence, can, can be used in court, uh, to show that the signer actually wanted to make a certain declaration, that it was not just a draft uh, that he wanted to hide somewhere in a shelf, but it's something that he wanted to give to others and that he wanted others to be able to rely on. Signatures are also a warning, caution you're doing something that has some legal relevance. So before you sign, uh, you should actually think about what you're doing. Uh, and, well, less important, but still an issue, they mark that a document is finished, they mark the end of the document. Um, that's actually something that I find uh, quite funny in the, the German court system. So German lawyers often use facts, even nowadays. Um, and the problem is they work in the last minute like I do. So if they have to send a fax to a court, they usually do that, sometimes do that at 10 minutes to midnight before the, the, the deadline is. And <coughs> sometimes uh, they don't get through in time. So what happened was that a fax got through, but the last page with the signature only arrived after midnight. So the uh, document was not accepted. What clever lawyers did next was to sign above the document, but then uh, the courts decided, no, the signature has to be below the document because they mark the end of the document. And the German word for signature is Unterschrift, which means subscript, so it's written under the document, it cannot be above. Uh, that's a sign that was not important for the talk, I just found that curious from the computer scientist's perspective uh, to still have these kinds of issues in the actual court system. Why am I talking about signatures in law? Obviously because I think there's a connection between the digital signatures in cryptography and uh, the signatures that we know from legal transactions. So we have the goal of uh, authenticity, for example. Um, we have the goal of non-repudiation, which I did not specifically address under that uh, term or under that name uh, in the legal aspect. <coughs> That's something that lawyers also want. You want to take responsibility for a document and that's proven by the signature. So we probably want to use cryptographic signatures if we sign legal documents, which we are going to do in an electronic form. And you can also uh, print it, then sign it uh, with a pen, then scan it and then send it to someone else, which is actually the way that's normally done, at least in German law or in German court system. But that's not where we, we want to go. So uh, for the past about 20 years, um, there has been the idea that uh, signatures in the cryptographic sense are supposed to be used in the uh, business or legal context. And if they are used that way, then they should be regulated by law because you cannot just say, well, I'm going to do anything that I now call a cryptographic signature. But um, 
to actually have a legal consequence, there should be a legal regulation about how such a signature look, looks like. And there are different approaches how to do that. Um, and that's actually what I want to tell you, that there might be problems with these approaches. Simple regulation approach is the eSign Act uh, of the United States. On the federal level, they also have uh, laws on the state level, but the federal level has this eSign Act, which says the term electronic signature means an electronic sound symbol. So it means something electronic uh, which was executed or adopted by a person with the intent to sign the record. So it's the person's intent that counts not some technical security. So I've done some of these signatures in the American sense. Uh, so if I, I have a copyright agreement with an American publisher, they usually <coughs> point me to a website where um, the declar declaration is uh, typed on the website and I just type my name below that. And that's a signature. That doesn't have any cryptography, so it's not very valuable as evidence, but it still fulfills some of the other functions. So it warns me now you're doing something legally relevant, for example. So I know I shouldn't type my name under something that says uh, contract or declaration uh, without paying attention. Evidence is then uh, considered separate. You might think, well, these crazy Americans, we are completely different in Europe, but actually the European definition of uh, an electronic signature is this one. Data in electronic form, which is attached to or logically associated with other data in electron, uh, electronic form and which is used by the signatory to, si to sign, which is actually the same thing. So uh, signature only needs to be used to sign something. It doesn't have to have any security value. But the difference is that um, the European regulation has several levels of signatures. So this signature exists, but it's basically not completely worthless, but uh, next to worthless. There is also advanced electronic signatures, which has some extra requirements, which will come in a few minutes. And a third level, a qualified electronic signature, which is even more secure. That's probably all you have to know right now. More secure than the advanced signatures. Um, they have different requirements, and they have different consequences. For example, when used as evidence, um, the third one is actually the best one because it's the most secure. So it's best to prove that someone actually performed the signature. So now that's perhaps a good regulation, but the question is now uh, how much further should it go into detail? So we have um, these definitions here, which are pretty much useless to a cryptographer because it doesn't say anything about key lengths or parameters or so on. So the question is, is that a good regulation? Should it be more general, like use state-of-the-art algorithms, and that's it? Or is it use of the RSA algorithm, which is a specific signature algorithm, with a key length of 2048 bits or more, and combined with the SHA-256 function, which you don't need to know about, or maybe even further, as implemented in software XYZ version 1.3? So that would be perfectly valid because different softwares might have different security levels. So you could write into regulation, uh, use the software XYZ version 1.3. Um, would work uh, if there was no technical and or mathematical progress. Why does technical or mathematical progress play a role? Uh, considering that cryptography is actually thousands of years old, so why is anything changing? Well, the current mathematical understanding of cryptography is not thousands of years old. A few decades old, you can't pinpoint it to a certain date, but uh, it's not hundreds of years old. Asymmetric cryptography, which is used for digital signatures, is 40 years old. Uh, so it was invented uh, in the 17th, the first algorithm used actually for uh, electronic sign or digital signatures was published by Rivers, Chamier, and Edelman in 1977. Side note, it was actually invented before that in 1973, but it was by a secret service, uh, the GCHQ, so we didn't know about that until uh, 20 years ago. Uh, that's an algorithm that's still in common use, and that's uh, based on a mathematical problem, finding prime factors of large numbers. 
Um, and it's good to illustrate the progress that has been made in the last 40 years, which is a short period for many laws. Uh, civil code of, uh, the French civil code goes back to the early 19th century, German civil code is from 1900. So asymmetric cryptography and digital signatures are a new development, uh, especially if you look at it from a lawyer's perspective. And how that matters is shown here. That number up there is a number uh, which is actually a product of two prime numbers, and that's the basis of the RSA algorithm, as I said. It's a 129-digit number, and in 1977, um, Ron Rivest, um, one of the inventors of the algorithm, said, well, that number, um, if it's um, factored into the two prime factors it has, uh, allows you to decrypt the following message. But no one will be able to do that, because I estimate it's going to take more than 40 quadrillion years with a quadrillion being 10 to the power of 15. That's the American version. Uh, there was also the old one where it has a different definition. But it's a long time. We can agree on that. Uh, and the same uh, challenge would also apply to signatures. So an RSA-based signature could also be forged um, if you were able to do that calculation, which takes longer than 40 quadrillion years. What do you think is the estimate nowadays uh, to break that code, to factor the, this number? Yeah? Um, probably something like that. So you said a couple of days. Um, actually, it was factored in 1994, which is a tad less than uh, the 40 quadrillion years that were estimated just uh, 18 years before that. The solution was, uh, the decrypted message was, the magic words are squeamish, squeamish ossifrage, which is a bird which is shown there to the right. So if you had fixed in 1977, uh, that according to that statement, that a signature with a 129-digit number as the challenge, uh, that would not be a good law nowadays. <coughs> so the usual way to deal with that is to refer to state of the art which can be done quite vaguely. You have to use state-of-the-art systems or even implicitly. The uh, regulation, as we saw, said uh, there must be data uh, that the signatory can, with a high level of confidence, use under his sole control. So if someone else was able to break that key, uh, then that would no longer be possible. So that's an <coughs> uh, implicit uh, reference to the state-of-the-art. Or you can name specific standards, and that's what Germany, for example, did under the current uh, signature legislation from before the current uh, EU regulation, where a federal agency publishes a catalog with valid algorithms on a regular basis every two years. And there's a new catalog. So basically, in the first case, you outsource the issue to the court system, and the court will have to decide, was that algorithm state of the art? In the second case, you outsource it to a specialist in a federal agency, who, by the way, again, outsource it to a different federal agency because the first one doesn't have the competence to do that. Uh, so anyway, the responsibility is shifted from the legislator to the expert. So that's one of the issues, how to actually do that shift to the expert. But in the end, the lawyers are going to have to ask cryptographers, and it's not the lawyers themselves to decide that which is kind of an issue in itself, but uh, there are many fields of law where, where uh, lawyers and judges have to rely on expert statements. So that's the first issue. It's about algorithms and their parameters and how uh, secure they have to be. But uh, that's actually only a small part because cryptography only deals with a part of the problem of signatures and their security. So cryptography deals with the algorithms and the data and how to apply a private key and how to apply a public key to sign or to verify a signature. Um, and you can prove with a mathematical proof that um, well, a signature scheme cannot be broken by an attacker who has certain properties. Law, on the other hand, is about real world issues, which are a bit more complex. So the question is, who was the person that signed? How does the identity of that person have to be verified? And how do you protect access to the public key, <laughs> so uh, to the private key? Um, 
do you put the private key on a USB stick lying around somewhere in the office uh, where 50 other people can just get it? Uh, or what do you have to do with that? That's not a cryptographer's issue, that's a, so to say, real world issue. Uh, but there is a connection between the two and that connection is called certificates. Certificates are, once again, signed documents, signed with cryptographic means, that confirm that a public key used to verify the signature actually belongs to a certain person. So in that example, the uh, certificate belongs to Mr. John Doe, and that statement is signed by a certain person uh, on the 31st of March 2017 in Athens. Um, that person here has to be a trusted person, actually a trusted authority, so-called certification authority. Um, and the result is, well, of course, you still have to verify the public keys of that certification authority, because otherwise the signature would be worthless, but you don't have to, um, to verify the public keys of every individual person, because you trust the certificate authority. <coughs> So um, sometimes the trust was not justified, as it has turned out, but all of you have in your web browsers a list of public uh, key authorities or certification authorities, which you trust to sign these um, documents, these certificates. Though so you might not know it, but you do because you've downloaded the browser. So um, we have that link from public key to identity. Now the question is, that's again a technical thing. How does law deal with that? And law deals uh, with these requirements in the following way. We will get back to the certificates in a second from the legal perspective, but let's start with the overall requirements of uh, advanced electronic signatures. So you know that was the second level, electronic signatures, the basic level. Advanced electronic signatures now the second level. And these are the requirements laid down in the um, European uh, EIDAS regulation, uh, saying that an advanced electronic signature <coughs> has to meet the following requirements. It must be uniquely linked to the signatory, must be capable of identifying the signatory, that's where the certificates can come in. Um, it's created using a private key that the signatory can keep under his sole control. We already mentioned that. That's not a cryptographic problem, but it's a problem of how to store the key. And it has to be linked to the data signed uh, that in such a way that any subsequent change in the data is detectable. So what do you think? Uh, if you use a standard uh, cryptographic algorithm to sign a document, will it fulfill these requirements? Assuming you have to uh, you have a way to fulfill number B, identifying the signatory, but the rest, is that fulfillable with each cryptographic signature scheme? Is that the same as cryptographic definitions of the signature? Um, and it turns out... Well, I don't know, there was a question? Or it was a question. Sorry about this. So I, I don't know what, what about B, for example, like how do you identify the signature? So B is a problem, would you say A is a problem? <laughs> yeah. uh, so I think A is actually a problem, which is, it's not in the typical definitions of A, because it says the signature has to be uniquely linked to the signatory. The typical cryptographic definitions would not necessarily say that about the signature. So the usual assumption is that the key pair belongs to one person. That's a common thing, but the signature doesn't necessarily have to be. So what you can do is you can have a signed document and then someone else generates a new key pair which leads to the same signature for the same document. Which is kind of weird why you'd want to do that. The only reason is to show that it doesn't fulfill the legal requirements if the scheme exists, but it's not excluded by the typical definitions used by cryptographers. You can easily solve that, you can easily add that to the definitions. Uh, it's not a real problem, but you have to think about it. So in that case, actually, the legal definition is a bit stricter. Um, and I only know about that because a colleague of mine did his PhD on the, these types of effects. Um, so it's not a common thing, but it's one small thing to show. Legal and technical definitions might actually differ, which you would not notice at first glance. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we also talked about um, the certificates. 
So the uh, regulation also says um, you need a qualified electronic signature creation device. That's usually a smart card. So if you know these uh, smart cards you use for, uh, you used to have them as uh, phone cards, but nowadays credit cards have these smart cards on them. Similar smart cards are also used uh, to generate qualified signatures because the chips can make sure that uh, the private key never leaves th that smart card. Uh, so it's more secure than just doing it in software. And it must be based on a qualified certificate, um, which basically means th there are some requirements for the certification authority, how they check your identity when you get that certificate, which confirms it's actually you who is signing it. So um, these requirements are there in the law. They are not important for a cryptographer because it's just management issues, but it's uh, something to keep in mind from the lawyer's perspective. Now, once again, the question, do the technical requirements and the legal requirements actually match and how good do they match? Considering that the signature legislation has always uh, wants to be technology neutral. That's what they say. Uh, so if you read the um, recitals, so basically the reasoning behind the regulation and also behind the previous signature directive which we had in the EU, it says, well, it's supposed to be technology neutral. We only have this set of requirements. Um, and any um, public key scheme or any cryptographic scheme fulfilling these requirements can be a signature scheme. But in reality, what they did was looking at classical public key cryptography introduced in the 1970s, uh, exchanging some terms. So instead of private key, they said the signature creation data. But that's it. And uh, I want to show that with a small example uh, with a slightly different <coughs> function of signatures, which is not covered by the technology neutral law. That's identity-based cryptography. Um, so the concept between identity -based, uh, behind identity-based cryptography is that uh, you replace the public key by some uh, text which can be a name, for example. So my name might actually be my public key. Consequence is my private key cannot be generated by myself, but there has to be some central authority uh, to generate my private key and to give me the private key for Christoph Sorge, which is my name, because otherwise anyone could just self-generate any private keys. So Alice now has this private key, and she signs, it, uh, shines, uh, she signs a document with that uh, private key. And anyone knowing just Alice's identity, Alice's name, can verify this signature. So this, uh, the identity is in place of the public key now. Um, so the question now would be, would such a small variation of public key cryptography or asymmetric cryptography actually still fulfill the requirements? Um, and the question, uh, the answer is no. Uh, first. Issue could be, is the key still under my um, sole control if someone else generates the key for me? And you might think no, because the private key generator can impersonate anyone. He can ge generate the private keys for any person. But in the uh, regulation, there is a possibility for remote signatures, which actually allows someone else to handle the signature generation on my behalf. Um, also, classically, the, the private keys have been generated by certification authorities. It's just that they were not allowed to keep copies. And uh, because they issued the certificates, they can also impersonate anyone. So I think that's not the issue. You still have sole control over your private key in the same, uh, in a very similar manner than you had before. Problem is, you don't have certificates anymore. Um, you could say that when you sign something, it's basically the same thing as a certificate because you then have the link from an identity to a key. But according to the regulation, there must be a certificate database which you cannot have there. So identity-based cryptography does not allow qualified signatures per se, which is why I'm saying it's not actually technology neutral legislation, which is just a small example. I mean, it's a, not, not really practically important, but it shows the general problem that uh, the goal of regulating something uh, from a different domain, in that case, 
legislator or lawyers trying to regulate uh, cryptography uh, requires uh, intensive communication between the two fields. So I'm pretty certain that the politicians who drafted the regulation were not aware that there is something else than this traditional public key or asymmetric cryptography. So um, basically, that's the core uh, issue behind it. And I see that core issue in some other fields as well. Um, one example uh, in data protection legislation, which is completely different from signature legislation, but they also have the problem of regulating technical processes. <coughs> and one very important question is, uh, should encrypted data be considered as personal data? Because you know, personal data is legally protected, and um, when it's encrypted, you might say, well, then it's no longer personal for someone who doesn't have the key, of course. So you could, for example, upload your encrypted backups to a cloud server and store them there, and that would not be a legal issue. And there has been some discussion in the legal community. Half of the uh, lawyers saying, well, encryption is not really secure, so it's ba a bad idea to upload encrypted data to the cloud. It's still personal data, so using cloud storage is actually forbidden unless you, uh, you follow this set of regulations for processing personal data. Um, the common misunderstanding behind that is uh, actually that encryption was somehow insecure. And actually nowadays cryptographers are really great because um, cryptography is never the issue in security. Almost never the issue in security. It's usually something uh, in the implementation, for example. So you're using uh, a good encryption algorithm on a computer which is infected with uh, malware, viruses, uh, something like that. Or you use a good encryption algorithm, but the software engineer um, who designs the actual implementation uh, made a flaw. So the misunderstanding is that cryptography was the issue here, which is actually not. So we always say if it's properly encrypted data, it's definitely not personal data for anyone who doesn't have the key. But that's one of the misunderstandings between the communities. Another uh, aspect where the two communities or the, the two <coughs> research areas overlap is uh, the protection of critical infrastructures, for which there is also European um, regulation. Um, question is, how do you protect the computer networks of uh, critical infrastructure like uh, industrial networks, uh, power plants, and uh, any of these other networks that people rely on? Should you introduce requirements for the use of cryptography there? In the finance sector, we have had this for some time. So um, if you want to handle credit card data, there are regulations uh, which are basically based on contracts uh, with the um, uh, credit card companies. So that there are these PCI, uh, or payment card industry, data security standards, uh, which regulate uh, the use of cryptography. Once again, there's a question, how detailed should that regulation be? And the common, as I said, the common problem is uh, to actually see the issues. And the regulating cryptography in that aspect is just, in my uh, understanding, a minor part. You should say, okay, use that state-of-the-art algorithm, which for encryption is basically always the same, AES, if it's symmetric encryption. Uh, but that's massively overestimated by many people from outside the IT security community. So the German uh, Telecommunications Act says that for data stored by the telecommunications operator uh, based on the data retention principles, they have to use a particularly secure encryption scheme. I don't know what that is because uh, <coughs> any encryption scheme nowadays is secure from today's perspective, state of the art. So no one would say, well, for my application, I want a less secure encryption standard than AES, but there is also none where everyone would agree it makes sense to use this and that because it's supposed to be more secure than AES. That just doesn't exist. So in my mind, there is no particularly secure encryption scheme, but um, I'm not a cryptographer myself. Uh, I've talked 
to them, they assure me that's true. But if someone of you is a cryptographer and would like to share his opinion on that, uh, I'd be happy to uh, discuss that. So um, to basically conclude the talk, um, regulation of cryptography does make sense to a certain extent. You have to be flexible um, to allow for technical developments. Um, you should allow some uh, variations in the technology. So just copying the basic ideas from a cryptography textbook does not give you technology neutral legislation. Um, and there should be an understanding that cryptography can actually do much more uh, than is generally known. So it's not just in the field of signatures, where I said there are identity-based signatures and uh, there are a number of other concepts, but also in the privacy sector, where you have so-called anonymous credentials, where you could authenticate um, without revealing your identity. That's something that might be interesting for many applications. Um, for example, I work in a project about smart meter, privacy smart electricity meters, uh, and their privacy and anonymous credentials would be great if the legislator had not written into the text, well, the smart meter has to identify itself to the electricity provider when uploading new information. So it has to be identified as an individual smart uh, meter, which would not be necessary with current uh, cryptographic schemes, which allow anonymous authentication. So it could prove it's a legitimate smart meter without revealing the specific identity but that's just not considered in any legislation, which is then much too narrow. So the question is, of course, on the other hand, how much responsibility can or could you shift towards <coughs> the experts? Um, in the political process, uh, where you, of course, expect democracy to work, so uh, it's supposed to be the elected people, and cryptographers are not usually elected into parliaments, uh, or they are not in the government. Um, Actually, we, we have a physicist as a uh, famous politician in Germany, uh, but that's as close as it gets. Uh, so the question is, how much can you move outside that democratic process and can you say, well, we say, ask the cryptographers and to implement their solution, and that's probably not the solution as well. So if you're waiting for my solution, I don't have one, I'm just uh, trying to point out some uh, issues with this. And the core issue, as I mentioned, is sometimes is with the communication between communities, um, the uh, computer science or cryptography community and the legal community, which uh, should of course not become uh, cryptographers, but who should have some basic understanding what can they actually do? Can they give us secure uh, electronic voting schemes? Can they give us other signature schemes than what we thought of? Um, or will we not talk to them because they are uh, dressed so strangely and they're just wearing t-shirts and not, not suit and tie. Uh, and I think actually an event like this is perfect to get into contact between the communities. And so thank you very much for that, for inviting me. And I hope I still have time to answer a few questions. Decentralization, rather, that 
the only way to get those two is by centralizing. You can't have a decentralized scheme like you do with public key generation where I could generate a public key and sign a document and you can trust that. We have to rely on a third party to do that. Um, do you think we're a long way away from squaring Zuko's triangle um, as, as in an abstract sense, or are you, you heartened by new technological developments as you perceive them? And then how long would it be before anyone in the legal context or the legal sphere would get comfortable with, with sanctioning a technology like that or, or a network like that, especially if it would potentially exist on a network that might be called Bitcoin or something like that? <laughs> Just your thought generally about, about Zuko's work. Okay, very good question. Um, the good ones are the ones that you have to think about. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure if I can give you, give you a good answer right away, but I can give you a gut feeling, which would say we are a long way from that because it's a problem of principle. It's not just that we need some faster computer or some better network to, to deal with that, uh, but really identity itself is, is the issue. Um, so I'm not thinking that in the global context you can actually solve that or in a nationwide context uh, you can probably get quite far if you look at the people I interact with on a daily basis uh, uh, like simplifying the exchange of uh, key material of um, public keys and uh, mapping these public keys to identities uh, so maybe you have the, the PGP web of trust which works well in a community of 20, 50 people but not a 50 million people I think that's a matter of principle. Any more questions? <coughs> There's one. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My question for you is, do you think in the current framework in your country at least, would it be possible to create a company of sorts that would uh, listen to smart code and do the action that the smart code does? So give the smart code some sort of legal substance and basically mirror the actions that the program makes. Would that be possible at this time? Um, good, another good question. Um, Technically, that should be possible, but technically, I mean, the legal, technical thinking. Um, the problem is you would expect the code to have uh, its own money, or in a way, or? Yes, for example, like a company that when the code says, buy something from this other mm -hmm. company, the company would take the legal methods to actually make the purchase and just pay it Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other cryptographic So. Uh, the answer is, in principle, that's feasible. Um, actually, I wrote my master's thesis about that, that issue. It wasn't called smart contract or smart code at that time. It was called autonomous agents, but <laughs> it was in the same direction. Uh, you get a lot of problems in the details. So as long as everything works correctly, those contracts would probably be enforceable. But what if there is a bug in the software? Who would have to take responsibility for that? And these questions are not really answered uh, by the court system, and it's not so clear from looking at the, um, at the actual text of the law. So um, I would say in good weather, it works. <laughs> um, but for the rest, to have actually the legal certainty uh, that you don't lose all your money because of a bug in the software, uh, we would basically have to wait for the first court decisions, which have not been made yet. <coughs> 